So a couple of notes on electron configurations. The first one I think we've mentioned that if you have a D4 or a D9 element, those are going to borrow from the preceding S orbital to become S1 D5 instead of S2 D4 or S1 D10. And secondly, transition metals tend to lose preceding S electrons before losing D electrons. So if you have titanium metal, 4s2, 3d2, and it becomes the titanium 2 plus ion, it's going to lose the 4s2, so the final configuration would be ending as a 3d2 for Ti2 plus. So with that in mind, let's do the electron configurations of ferrous Fe2+, plus, ferric Fe3+, plus, cuprous Cu+, plus, and cupric Cu2+. Plus. First of all, for the iron, we write out the electronic configuration for iron. Well, let's see. Where's iron? It's right here in the 3D. So the preceding noble gas is argon. So that's the argon core. Then 4S2, 3D1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So argon core, 4S2, 3D6. Now, for a 2 plus ion, it's got to lose two electrons. Well, it's going to lose the 4S2. So you're going to end with argon core, 3D6. How about iron 3 plus, the ferric state? Well, it's already 3d6. It's got to lose one more electron. The only place it can take it is from this d6. So you will have argon core 3d5. Now for cuprous, Cu plus, look up uh, copper here, right here. So that's argon core for S1, 3d10, because that's a d9. So it borrows from the preceding 4s to become 4s1, 3d10. And now it's got to lose one electron. Well, of course, it's going to lose the 4s1, and you'll have argon core 3d10. And for the cupric, Cu2+, plus, needs one more electron. It's going to take it from the 3d10, and you'll have argon core 3d9. Now, another trend is that P block elements with D electrons might lose their outer NS and NP electrons to form ions and not disrupt a filled N minus 1 D10 orbital. So, with this in mind, what ions would tin tend to form? So, let's look up. Where's tin? It's right here. And that means you've got a 5s, 4d, 5p situation. The preceding noble gas is krypton. Then you have 5s2, then your 4d10, then 5p2. So if it tends to lose the s and the p electrons and not touch the d, I would say that tin would first ionize by getting rid of these 5s2 electrons. And so for tin 2, you'd have krypton core 4d10, 5p2. And if it lost these 5p2 electrons, in addition to that, you'd have a tin 4 ion, krypton 4d10. Now, we're going to start talking about periodic trends, and one of them is atomic radius. And how do we find what the atomic radius is in the first place? Well, it's half the distance between two atoms. If it's a pure element and frozen, we call that a non-bonded situation, like frozen krypton. And from the density, we can actually calculate the distance between two krypton radii, and half of that distance would be the radius of one krypton atom. So we can do it from elements in their solid state. 
We can also do it in bonded situations. We have, say, for example, two bromine atoms bonded together. And we can determine the distance of that bond and then one half the distance of that bond, in the case of bromine, would give you the radius of the bromine atoms. The big trend that we're going to notice here is that as you move from left to right across a row, or you move up a column that the atomic radius decreases. If we graph this, here's hydrogen, helium drops down a little bit, We'll learn why in a little bit. And then when we go to the n equals 2, it shoots up to lithium, which is the largest in the period. And then it drops steadily as we go across the period, lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and we end up at neon. And then when we go to n equals 3, it shoots up again to sodium. That has the highest radius in that period. And as you go across that third period, you get to argon. Argon will be the smallest in that third period. So for atomic radii, it's the noble gases that have the smallest radii in each period. Now here's a table that compares the sizes of neutral atoms to their ionized form, either as cations or anions. Lithium loses an electron, becomes a cation, Li+, plus, and we see that the size of the Li+, plus is 90. The size of the lithium atom is 134. The cation is smaller. Same with beryllium. Be is 90. Beryllium ion is 59. Boron is 82. The boron cation is 41. So the cation becomes smaller than the neutral atom. What about the anion? Oxygen gains two electrons, and it becomes larger. It was 73 as the neutral atom. It becomes 126. And fluoride is 119 compared to 71 for the neutral atom. So as we make cations, the cations are smaller than the neutral atoms. As we make anions, the anions are larger than the neutral atoms. The second one is ionization energy. Minimum energy needed to remove an electron from an atom in the gaseous state. That's what ionization energy is. And it is always an endothermic process. In other words, if you have an attraction between a positive nucleus and an electron, it requires energy to pull the electron away. That's an endothermic process. Thirdly, valence electrons are the easiest to remove because valence electrons are furthest from the nucleus. And here's how you would write the equation. An element in a gaseous form plus the required ionization energy, the first ionization energy, forms a plus one cation and one electron. The first ionization energy is equal to the energy to remove an electron from the neutral atom. The second is the energy required to remove an electron from the plus one ion and so forth. As you move from left to right across a row or up a column, the ionization energy increases. So if we want to see a graph of what that looks like, here it is. And you know, it's just the inverse of the atomic radius graph. The highest values here are the noble gases, whereas before the noble gases had the lowest radius, but they have the highest ionization energy. And if you just think about that a second, it's pretty obvious that as the radius is smaller, then that electron is closer to the nucleus and it takes more energy to pull it away. So it'll have a higher ionization energy. So the smaller the radius, the larger the ionization energy is going to be. And look at helium. It's enormous, right? Very high ionization energy. Just take one electron away from helium. And then it drops like off a cliff down to lithium because now you have 
the 2s1 electron, which is relatively easy to pull off. And as you go across the period, it begins to rise. But there are a couple of hiccups here and here. We'll look at those in a minute. In each one of these, you have these little anomalies here. And then it goes up to a noble gas as you get to the far right. And then it crashes down as you move down to the next row. The first hiccup we'll look at is beryllium and boron. Beryllium has a higher ionization energy than boron does. Well, beryllium is 1s2, 2s2. Boron is 1s2, 2s2, 2p1. And so now you have an electron in a p orbital rather than an s orbital. It's a little bit easier to remove an electron from a p orbital than an s orbital because p orbital is further away on average from the nucleus. If we go up to the next hiccup, nitrogen and oxygen, we have nitrogen, 1s2, 2s2, 2p3, and oxygen, 1s2, 2s2, 2p4, and oxygen has a little lower ionization energy. So to explain this, just think about the electron configurations in nitrogen. You have a singlet electron in each of the p orbitals, px, py, and pz. But oxygen has a fourth electron, and it has to pair up in the same orbital as a plus one half electron. And when electrons share an orbital, it's of higher energy because electrons repel each other. So it's a little bit easier to remove this fourth electron from oxygen than it is to remove one of these electrons from nitrogen. And that's why you have this little hiccup here. And oxygen has a lower ionization energy than nitrogen does. Here's another way to depict ionization energy. You can get an idea of the trend. As you move across, ionization energy generally increases. You get to the maximum at the noble gases. There are the hiccups, nitrogen and oxygen, and beryllium and boron. But in general, as you go across, ionization energy is increasing. And that holds true for each of the other periods in the periodic table. Now, there's one last concept we're going to look at called electron affinity. And that's the energy released when a neutral atom gains an electron. It happens in the gaseous state. And uh, the equation looks this way, that you have an element in the gaseous form. You add an electron to it, and you get an anion. And you get energy either given up or sometimes taken on. It's defined as exothermic, like this reaction shows, but it may actually be endothermic. And it is in the case of alkali, earth metals, and noble gases. It would be endothermic if you tried to force feed an electron to a noble gas. The more energy that's released, in other words, more negative, the larger the electron affinity is going to be. And it generally increases across a period and becomes more negative from left to right. The lowest electron affinities in a period are the alkali earth metals and the noble gases. The highest electron affinity in a period are the halogens. So here's a table that kind of reinforces that. Lithium is minus 60. That's a negative exothermic energy, giving an electron to lithium to become Li minus, but then beryllium has an endothermic energy. It's greater than zero. Boron, you can do it with boron. It's minus 27. Carbon is minus 122. Um, it's endothermic again with nitrogen, exothermic with oxygen, very exothermic with fluorine, and then the noble gas. Again, we're in positive enthalpy territory. So now I want to talk about factors that affect periodic trends. We've seen trends in size of atomic radii, in ionization energy, 
in electron affinity, what are the factors that affect those trends? The first is Coulomb's law, but where potential energy equals this, where Q1 and Q2 represent the magnitude of the charges. If Q1 is positive and Q2 is negative, then there'll be an attractive force between those two particles, and the overall energy will be negative or exothermic as they approach each other. If the two charges have the same sign, both are positive or both are negative, of course, they're going to repel one another. Now, the distance between the particles is represented by the letter R. So the energy involved is inversely proportional to the distance between the two particles. So the closer those charges are to one another, the larger that energy, either exothermic or endothermic energy, is going to be. The second effect is something called the screening or shielding effect. And this is where inner electrons shield the full positive charge of the nucleus from outer shell electrons. The inner shell electrons shield the outer shell electrons from experiencing the full charge of the nucleus. And so we talk about an effective nuclear charge for the electrons being shielded. Another factor is that electrons that share the same orbital repel one another. And lastly, the overall distance from the nucleus increases as the n quantum number increases. Now, which takes more energy to remove an electron from a neutral hydrogen atom in this case, or from the helium cation, He+, which one would take more energy to pull this electron away, the ionization energy? Okay, if you said the helium ion would take more energy, you are so right. The hydrogen requires 1,311 kilojoules to separate these two particles. And the helium ion requires a whopping 5,250 kilojoules to separate these two particles. Reason? You've doubled the positive charge. Helium has two protons, or two positive charges, in the nucleus. And therefore, because of Coulomb's law, there's a much stronger attraction between the positive nucleus and the negative electron, and requires almost five times more energy to separate the two particles. All right, how about this one? Which takes more energy to remove an electron from a helium atom, that's this one, or from the ion He plus, and why? Well, in this it takes much more energy to separate this electron from He plus than one of these electrons from the helium atom. And the reason is that these two electrons inhabit the same 1s orbital, and they repel each other. And therefore, it makes it a little easier to pull one of these electrons off compared to He+, where this one electron inhabits the 1s orbital on its own, and there's no repulsion energy like that. So 2,372 kilojoules for the helium atom, and for the ion He+, 5,250 kilojoules. Which takes more energy, to remove an electron from the lithium atom or from the ion Li+. So here's the lithium atom, and here's the ion Li+. All right, here we go. If you said it takes more energy to remove an electron from Li+, take a bow, you're right. Quite a bit more. Lithium ion, 7,300 kilojoules. The neutral lithium atom, 520 kilojoules. And the reason this 2s electron is protected from the full positive charge of the nucleus by the shielding effect of the 1s electrons. The inner electrons are shielding or screening the full nuclear charge, the 3 plus nuclear charge, from the outer shell electron. And therefore, it's much easier to remove this outer shell electron than it is to remove 
an electron from the 1s, which has no screening because there's no interlying electrons between that electron and the nucleus. Just let's take a look at this screening effect again and the effect of nuclear charge. Here we have a lithium atom. Here's an electron. Here's an electron. These are the 1s electrons, the inner 1s electrons. And then out here somewhere would be the 2s electron. And these core electrons in the 1s are screening the full nuclear charge from the outer 2s electron. And the effect of nuclear charge actually is only plus 1 on the outer shell electron rather than 3 plus on the outer shell electron. Here's another one which requires more energy to ionize to a plus 1 ion, lithium or beryllium. Here's lithium atom, two electrons in the 1s, one electron in the 2s, and here's a beryllium, two electrons in the 1s, and two electrons in the 2s. Well, if you said beryllium, you'd be right. And the reason is you've got a 4 plus nuclear charge here. You only have a 3 plus nuclear charge here. And even though you have a screening effect going on in both of these, and even though you have a little bit of a repulsive energy in the electrons in the 2s orbital, you've still increased the positive charge of the nucleus by 1. And that has a big effect on the attraction to these outer shell electrons. So it takes more energy to ionize a beryllium atom to the beryllium plus one ion. Now, which has the smaller atomic radius, lithium or beryllium? Beryllium has a plus four nuclear charge, while lithium has only a plus three. So this increases the effective nuclear charge on the outer shell electrons of beryllium and they are drawn closer to the nucleus, thus diminishing the atomic radius. As we have seen, this trend continues across a period because the charge of the nucleus keeps increasing while the counter electrons are added to the same principal energy level shell. It isn't until electrons begin to inhabit the valence shell of the next period that the atomic radius increases.